Osteoporosis has been uh, called a silent epidemic, but really it's not all that silent. Uh, it's been the focus of quite a bit of activity, uh, both clinical and uh, scientific, uh, over the last 25 years. And um, arguably, we've made as much progress in this area of the menopause as almost any other uh, area of the menopause. And so there have been some very exciting advances. There are new drugs and uh, a lot of options for the clinician. Uh, thankfully, uh, controversies have uh, not been totally absent, but not quite as dramatic as, uh, as has been the case with uh, estrogen and breast cancer when dealing with the menopause, or more recently, uh, estrogen and heart disease. There, there have been some uh, uh, controversial areas uh, with uh, uh, osteoporosis and its treatment, but uh, on a smaller scale, and we'll uh, look at some of these uh, uh, issues as we go along. So we're going to talk about the prevention of osteoporosis, and osteoporosis is defined as a, a skeletal disease that uh, it really uh, is characterized by loss of bone mass, some microarchitectural derangement of the bone. This leads to fragility of the bone, and this in turn leads to uh, fracture. Uh, bone remodeling is a, a uh, common uh, uh, everyday metabolic occurrence uh, in the human being, and the fact that bone is constantly being broken down uh, and rebuilt is uh, not abnormal. This goes on throughout the life of uh, every person. Um, normally, uh, there is a balance between the amount of bone that is broken down and the amount of bone that is uh, consequently uh, rebuilt, but as one enters the menopause, uh, the uh, balance is disrupted and uh, probably due uh, in no small part to the loss of uh, ovarian and estrogenic functions. Um, the uh, loss of bone uh, begins to overwhelm the, ability, the body's ability to, uh, to uh, replace bone. And uh, consequently, bone thins, uh, gets more fragile, bone mass is decreased, and uh, fracture uh, risk is increased. We see this in this uh, graphic cartoon here, um, basically looking uh, at normal bone and then the osteoclasts, which are specialized cells uh, uh, which will break bone down, and uh, the osteoblasts, which reform bone, leaving at the bottom what you essentially had at the top. And if there is an overbalance of resorption versus formation, uh, then you are left with a, a fragile, somewhat thinned bone. Um, most of the agents, and virtually not all of the therapeutic agents available to us today to treat uh, osteoporosis are anti-resorptive agents. So they interfere with uh, the second line of this cartoon here. They interfere and try to cut down the amount of resorption, knowing that the body, as one ages, uh, loses uh, much of the ability to refill the resorbed areas. So we get this, and we've all looked at these slides on numerous occasions. This is healthy cancellous or trabecular bone, uh, nice thick uh, trabecular areas there. This is uh, stable bone. Uh, there are areas of remodeling you can clearly see. It's not smooth all over the place. It's not synchronized, the remodeling that goes on. It varies from uh, area to area in the body, um, but it's a very normal occurrence. On the other hand, in osteoporosis, osteopenia, when you begin to lose bone mass, you can see the thinning of the trabecula in the bone. You can see the uh, subsequent uh, um, fragility of the bone. You can see in the lower left-hand corner of this slide uh, the speculations, the actual fracture of some of these trabecula. And, and you can, with a little fantasy, see that this represents, as it were, the skeleton of the skeleton. The internal support structure of bone itself is worn away so that the bone becomes fragile and uh, has a greater tendency uh, toward fracture. And that leads to this. This is an older slide which clearly shows uh, what happens to bone in, uh, as women go through menopause. This is a vertebral body, uh, nice, thick, healthy uh, trabeculations in the top uh, part of this photo. And in the bottom, you can see the, the uh, fractured uh, vertebrae of an older woman. If you look inside the vertebral body, you see these washed out areas. It's just a lack of bone, lack of uh, internal support. In this particular uh, vert vertebral body, we see a biconcave type of fracture. You can see the fracture of the concavity on one side or the other, or both sides, or you can see a wedge deformity of the bone. Uh, and this spinal fracture, it's not easy to see, but uh, these are a series of wedge uh, deformities, wedging fractures of the uh, thoracic spine, which leads to this uh, uh, exaggerated kyphosis, um, uh, eventually to a lot of pain, 
uh, it leads to this in this cartoon. Uh, you can see the normal healthy woman of approximately uh, age 55 already into menopause, but by age 65 she's begun to have uh, specific spinal changes. You can see uh, changes in the elevations in the height of the vertebral body leading it by the time she's age 85 to a uh, kyphosis, uh, a loss of height, uh, stooping. Uh, this is very painful. Uh, there is downward pressure on the viscera, downward pressure on the diaphragm. This leads to uh, pain, difficulty in ambul ambulation, uh, sometimes with respiration. Uh, this is a relatively bone unhealthy woman and a relatively unhappy woman. She has a, a great deal of limitations in uh, her day-to-day -day, uh, activities and in her, uh, the very act of getting around. Um, this woman, you do not see the, uh, the uh, characteristic abdominal protuberances that you, uh, the protuberance that you'll see in most women, but you do see the exaggerated uh, kyphosis of the uh, thoracic spine. She's got a cane and it's already difficult for her uh, to get around. She'll be in a lot of pain also. Um, Physiologically, uh, bone density will peak somewhere between the ages of 25 and 30. And in interestingly enough, men are always outpacing women as far as bone mass is concerned. There are a few factors, uh, some hormonal, but size may play a role, diet plays a role. Uh, but they're generally parallel up to the point of around age uh, uh, 50. So the bone peaks at age 25 to 30, it plateaus for a few years, and somewhere between the ages of 35 and 40, both men and women begin to lose bone, so that uh, they lose bone very gradually, but in a parallel mode. But uh, women always losing a little bit at a, at a little bit uh, higher rate than men will lose. Um, and then they hit the menopause. That is, women reach the age of 50. At the age of 50, there is no dramatic change in the uh, rate of bone loss in men, but women begin to uh, um, undergo an, an ex uh, accelerated uh, loss of bone uh, that lasts for almost 20 years into the menopause. The initial loss rate, as you can see in this slide, is about 1% per year, but maybe as high as 3% per year. And this is following the loss of estrogen, which in turn follows the loss of ovarian function. This persists. Uh, throughout the first two decades of the uh, uh, menopause. And the result is that a woman on average may lose almost half of her vertebral and femoral bone over the course of her lifetime. That by the age of 65, uh, over a quarter of women will have had uh, vertebral fractures. Um, and there are about 30 million Americans affected with osteoporosis in this country. 80% of them are women. A woman reaching the menopause at age 50 faces about a 40%, some studies say as high as a 50% uh, future uh, fracture risk. For uh, This is for uh, any site fracture. The costs are astronomical. This slide is a little melodramatic. Uh, uh, it has always been difficult to estimate, even in the present and past, what the cost for osteoporotic fractures are. Therefore, it makes future estimations even more difficult. Uh, a, a subsequent slide will mention $50 billion. This slide mentions uh, hundred or hundreds of billions of dollars, but irrespective, uh, those are significant numbers. And they are numbers that uh, are um, ill-born by the system. We don't have that kind of money floating around to take care of this, so it behooves us as clinicians to, uh, to entertain um, really effective educational and therapeutic programs for our patients so that we can significantly cut into this fracture uh, story, uh, reduce the osteoporosis, reduce the subsequent fractures, and reduce the uh, health care costs. They, they are a r rather dramatic and uh, rather uh, um, pessimistic story as, uh, uh, as we uh, experience it uh, in these days. Um, you can see here that it's primarily a woman's problem. These are women on the left, men on the right, and uh, any site fracture, women just suffer more than men. Uh, this is particularly true in uh, wrist fractures, which are the, the lower uh, curve uh, on both sides. But in wrist fractures, the incidence, uh, the difference between men and women is uh, close to 10 to 1, nine, between 9 and 10 to 1. Uh, by the time men and women have aged, and the uh, type 2 or senile osteoporosis has set in, the hip fracture, which is the most dramatic uh, problem in uh, older patients, uh, the ratio between, between men and women in hip fracture is only somewhere between 2 and 3 to 1, but also uh, favoring women. 
therefore, uh, it is always a woman's problem throughout her lifetime, uh, much more significantly than it is uh, the problem of a man. And as far as society is concerned, it's catastrophic. Uh, of the 250 to 300,000 cases of hip fracture uh, that occur each year, fully one in five, 20% of patients will be dead within a year of the result of the hip fracture, most of those within six months. Another 30% will have to be hospitalized or institutionalized basically for the rest of their lives. So 50% of women, or I should say only 50%, of women suffering hip fracture will ever get back to the semblance of the life that they led before the fracture. And it is this business of terminal illness, of, uh, of uh, um, hospitalization, uh, um, intensive care units, as well as long-term institutionalization, which drives the cost problem. 400,000 hospital admissions a year related to osteoporosis, 2.5 million physician visits per year, 180,000 uh, nursing home admissions per year secondary to osteoporosis, driving a number that's projected in the next four decades to be around 50 billion. All right, 50 billion is not as bad as the hundreds of billions that the previous slide showed, but those are, those are heavy, heavy numbers. Uh, when, when we look at what's available in our health care uh, budgets and, uh, and the demands of others. This is not the only thing going on in the United States uh, at this time. Um, we've concentrated at this point in the lecture on, on the, uh, the melodrama surrounding hip fracture. That's not to belittle vertebral fractures. We tend, as clinicians, to underscore the role of vertebral fractures, saying that, uh, you know, there's a certain price to pay for aging. One of them is you'll, you will lose height. And uh, we tend to forget that these vertebral fractures have an importance in themselves, and uh, not only the fact that just from a clinical standpoint, vertebral fractures predict more vertebral fractures, and better still, they predict uh, subsequent hip fractures. So the vertebral fracture is clinically important uh, to the physician. Um, but there's also no question, and it's overlooked, unfortunately, that morbidity and mortality increase secondary to vertebral fractures. And there is an increase of symptomatology. Uh, certainly a major impact on the quality of life of uh, patients who are suffering from vertebral fractures, uh, and including an erosion of emotional status uh, and generally uh, diminished uh, um, uh, function. Uh, so the vertebral fractures also need to be taken seriously. And saying that, that means early intervention that we should not be slipshod in our, either our educational efforts or in our therapeutic efforts because vertebral fracture, uh, the price is paid early on. Going into the menopause, we see uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, accelerated bone loss in the spine. And whereas the price for the hip is not paid for decades, the price for the uh, vertebral fracture is paid uh, up front. And so that um, knowing that, that vertebral fracture probably is, is more important, more significant than, we, than we've allowed in the past, we ought to pay attention to prompt effective therapy as women are in the perimenopause or going forward into the menopause. The type 1 menopause, uh, uh, osteop type 1 osteoporosis we've, we've uh, discussed, this uh, is the uh, accelerated bone loss that primarily affects women and in the first two decades of the menopause, therefore from uh, 50s uh, to 70s, mainly involving trabecular bone and therefore mainly involving uh, the vertebra. Uh, risk fractures also start to pile up in women. As I said, they're 9 or 10, to, 10 times more um, prevalent in women than in men. Whereas the type 2 osteoporosis, the senile osteoporosis, is um, more or less uh, gender equalized to a, to a degree. This is the uh, effects of old age uh, um, from which both men and women suffer. Women now going into the senile osteoporosis have a much lower starting base to jump into senile osteoporosis because of all of the loss they've had in the, in the menopausal osteoporosis. Therefore, even though men do fall and break their hip, women still break their hip sometimes at a ratio of uh, two to three times more frequently than men do. But we begin to look at cortical uh, bone uh, fractures as well 
uh, in uh, senile osteoporosis. And senile osteoporosis um, has rarely been a major focus of therapy, although it has been shown in study after study and in virtually all of the agents which we've studied and looked at that they, they are efficacious at, at, at virtually any, any age in a patient's life. Nevertheless, when, when people get into their 80s and beyond, uh, there is a shift towards uh, uh, prevention by virtue of other, other uh, uh, means uh, trauma prevention and, and we shift to a more geriatric mode of thought than in uh, uh, the um, a prophylactic menopausal uh, uh, mode of thought that uh, is uh, prevalent in the uh, younger patients who are just uh, recently into the menopause. A lot of factors go into uh, bone loss. It isn't only loss of estrogen, obviously. Uh, there are genetic factors. There's a familial predisposition. Uh, aging certainly plays a tremendous role. Trauma plays a role, as you can see on the left-hand side there. Uh, other meta metabolic factors or diseases which uh, are associated with higher bone turnover, higher bone loss, will, will put a woman in bad uh, outset position uh, going forward into the menopause. Um, and low peak bone mass, which is a woman's problem due to size and other factors, uh, uh, women tend to bring more bone at any stage of their life uh, into, into the, uh, the osteoporotic wars of the uh, menopause. We have drifted away from these traditional risk factor lists. They don't support us clinically as much as we'd like. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they do play a role. They play a role in, in, in Medicare deciding whether or not you, you can identify risk factors and do, do bone densitometry studies in your patients. They're good uh, teaching and, and generally, Philip, from a uh, clinical standpoint, it's good to remember a few of these that osteoporosis is basically a, a, a condition affecting Caucasian and and Asian women, uh, slight build, slender, fair head women who, are, who may be tall and slender or just slender with small muscle mass. Um, certain uh, habits will lead to it, smoking and you can see at the bottom uh, alcohol abuse, inactivity and immobility, uh, vitamin deficiencies, calcium deficiencies, these are extremely important. In the United States virtually all women are calcium deficient. Uh, throughout the majority of their lives, and this has to be an effort that uh, is made across the board, beginning with the younger patients, uh, for the prevention of uh, bone loss and fracture. Other metabolic, you can see hyperprolactinemia there, diabetes, uh, amenorrhea, uh, corticosteroid use, heparin use, certain uh, diuretic use are also associated uh, as our low levels of sunlight. Certain areas in the country have a higher uh, disposition, uh, predisposition earlier age of menopause, so loss of, of ovarian and estrogenic support. Uh, age is dramatically uh, shown here. here these are two uh, studies looking at bone density in the lumbar spine of pre- and postmenopausal women and showing almost in linear fashion that as a woman ages, she will lose bone loss. That is a predictable uh, measure of aging. This is in lumbar spines, two to four. This is in the femoral neck, and you see some plateauing here, things happen a little bit later, uh, but generally uh, a trend in significant uh, bone loss and as women are older. On the right hand side of this graph, vis a vis women who are premenopausal, uh, where they have uh, an expected higher bone mass, and this is in the uh, femoral neck. And, and in this study from Huey that was published in, uh, in the Annals of uh, Clinical Invest General Clinical Investigation in 1988, we see that there is in a curvilinear manner a correlation between age and bone loss and fract fracture risk, uh, and very predictable. You can see going from left to right uh, 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 across the bottom of this graph uh, that uh, we have a woman who is uh, losing bone mass uh, or less bone mass and then going up from the bottom to the top uh, beginning at 45 and ending up at over the age of 80. At each five-year interval, there is an increased fracture risk associated uh, with low bone density. So that low bone density is a predictor of fracture, age is a predictor of fracture, and these we can intervene in the aging process, obviously, but we uh, can intervene uh, maybe to uh, uh, ensure better bone health for the majority of our patients. Since the title of this lecture is the prevention of uh, osteoporotic fractures, 
um, it would be do as well to depart a little bit from the traditional. We would hop from here right into therapeutic modalities, uh, get into the arguments about which drugs are the best, how to uh, uh, best treat uh, osteopenia, reverse it if possible, or, or inhibit it uh, uh, if possible. But um, there is a, 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 an issue with prevention that uh, has so far eluded most of our, of our activity as clinicians, and that is just general measures taken to prevent bone loss during the lifetime of our patients and patients who are not candidates for postmenopausal estrogen replacement therapy. And unfortunately, as I said, uh, the problem begins in adolescence with our young uh, girls uh, and continues through most of their life. Um, with the adolescents, um, we need to stress proper diet and we need to uh, stress exercise. Uh, some of the recent entitlement programs uh, mandating uh, uh, equality in uh, sports activities in high schools and colleges have, have gone a, a tremendous uh, uh, distance to uh, redress, uh, address and redress uh, the, the, the problem of young girls not getting enough exercise in their lives. Unfortunately, uh, the world gets divided into athletes and non-athletes, and we focus on, on girls uh, playing on varsity teams, but the majority in any school, uh, in high school and for sure in college, uh, are not playing any varsity sports. So we need to stress even for non-athletes the uh, importance of good exercise, and we need to stress the importance of calcium. As I've said before, uh, calcium deficiency is, is a mantra here in the United States. Uh, it affects, it, it's, it crosses all races and ethnic and socioeconomic and it's been a major nutritional problem forever and is today. Um, so it's important that we stress uh, the uh, uh, necessity of good calcium balance in our young patients as they adolescents, they go through puberty because that's when you're piling up the bone that you will take forward with you as you go through life and on into the menopause. As women move out of young adulthood into the reproductive age, nothing really changes. Uh, stressing proper diet, stressing proper exercise programs is important. Uh, Weight-bearing exercise is important. It has been said that swimming is not recommended as a, uh, as a bone-preserving exercise. I like swimming as an exercise because it preserves muscles in the heart. Uh, it's good for heart health. It is not particularly good for bone health because of the lack of uh, gravity. Um, Brisk walking will do the trick at almost any age, certainly in menopausal patients, but even in pre and reproductive age patients. Jogging is fine if a woman is in good shape and jogging. Uh, we've got to remember that as women go through their reproductive ages, as they have their babies, that high impact uh, aerobic type exercises, jogging, running, sometimes have negative effects on pelvic floor disorders, bladder uh, falling, uh, and may lead in some patients who are not really well trained or well prepared to uh, skeletal and joint uh, injuries and problems. So you don't have to push your patients to do iron triathletes or, or, or to be do pre-Olympic type of uh, training exercises. Just brisk walking or something that is conscientious, diligent, repetitive is what we need to do. Um, we need to, uh, of course, for uh, various reasons, other, you know, multiple multiplicity of reasons, uh, stress, uh, good habits, the lack of alcohol and uh, tobacco use. And um, in this reproductive age, it's important just to mention in passing that pregnancy and lactation per se really, really present any major problems as far as bone loss. There is bone loss uh, uh, in lactation, some, but rarely have any, any consequential sequelae to the patients under going through pregnancies and nursing their baby. So your patients don't have to worry too much about those particular areas in which uh, there is, there is uh, a significant loss of bone. You've got to stress again calcium and vitamin D. Look at the adolescents. This is from the uh, Department of Agriculture, an older slide which is just as uh, valuable today as it was 20 years ago. Um, with the exception at the baseline, you see uh, the uh, calcium levels, uh, uh, the uh, recommended daily allowance would probably be above 800 a day. It's moved upwards. But you can see that peak around puberty and lasting into young adulthood uh, with the uh, upward uh, box shape rise in the curve in the broken curve there and now you look at men and men approach puberty and, and, and just rise to the challenge they uh, I don't know if it's milkshakes or cheeseburgers or what but they're getting their calcium and they're getting ahead of their calcium needs on a daily basis and for the better part of their lives they're either at it or above it not a problem with men and men are bigger to begin with so they have probably stronger bones to begin with than most women but look at women 
look at this problem. Here we have the same curve. Again, you'll allow that the baseline uh, recommended daily has been moved up a little bit, but the peak is still up there. And, and at puberty, these tremendous demands, and at puberty, young girls probably become body conscious and development conscious, so they begin to avoid many of the foods that they think are going to put weight on, and they duck below their uh, recommended daily allowance of calcium and stay below it. Uh, for virtually the rest of their lives. So that this is a major problem that we've uh, taken a lot of pains to educate and, and, uh, and um, uh, correct, uh, but we're still not quite there. A lot of, there's a, a lot better calcium use in this country than there ever was before. In the perimenopausal patient, now we've got a lady who's past the reproductive age for the most part, not quite menopausal yet. Um, it's pretty much all of the same. You've got to keep women health conscious throughout every phase of their life. There's not a whole lot of difference. It's just a recognition of some limitations in physical activities, what you could do at 50, uh, what you could do at 15, and may not be able to do at 50. Um, there is the problem in perimenopausal women, there's a growing trend among clinicians to deal with it. Uh, women don't have to, uh, you don't have to deal with the menopause as if it's a one day to the next day event, which it isn't. It's an insidious uh, journey from reproductive to post-reproductive life, and it may go on for many years in some women, and so many clinicians are addressing it by adding back estrogen, a little bit of estrogen, even to premenopausal women, and many more to adding back low-dose contraceptives in that decade between the 40s and 50s. The, the low-dose contraceptives uh, kill many birds with one stone. They give you good cycle regularity in an age where women begin to suffer from irregular menstrual cycles. They provide contraception in an age when there are the highest uh, contraceptive failure uh, rate in the United States, unwanted pregnancies, high abortion rates in, those, uh, in that uh, decade. Um, whether or not they actually, going forward, give you better bone health is controversial. There were a number of papers that said it's really great, and in addition to everything else that estrogen does, um, giving estrogen to your uh, patients will uh, give them better, healthier bones as they onset into the menopause. There were some studies that, that supported that conclusion. Unfortunately, there have been other studies which do not support that conclusion, so that is an area for the clinician of some controversy, but is not an overriding concern. Uh, my own, in my own practice, I don't don't necessarily give hormones to perimenopausal women because of the bones. I give them for other reasons, but there may be um, there may be some bone benefits. And if some studies show there isn't, some show there isn't. That means that for some patients there may be, and for others there may not be. And so you know, it's uh, even if it's a zero sum game, uh, the patients that gain gain, and there's nothing, no harm done in giving them low dose contraceptives. Postmenopausal women, these are the obvious, these are the focus of our attention because everything dramatically comes to a point at this point and all of the, all of the bad habits of the first 50 years are suddenly uh, the bills come due at age 50 and uh, bad uh, lack of calcium and smoking and other habits, lack of exercise, uh, proper diet. So this becomes a major, major therapeutic uh, goal for us now. And again, we must ensure that the things that were made sense for a 15 and a 14-year-old make sense for a 50 and a 60-year-old. Um, her calcium needs will go up a little bit. They're revising them steadily upward for menopausal women and upward further still for the later menopausal geriatric patients. So as you look at the bottom of this uh, slide, uh, for the elderly, the geriatric patient, uh, diet and exercise are important, but with moderation, we need to uh, we need to work this out uh, with our geriatricians, with other people uh, involved in the healthcare of elderly patients. Calcium is important. Vitamin D important. Risk avoidance is important also. And this improve this involves a lot of things that we haven't, as gynecologists, been traditionally following. Uh, internists probably have done a better job of it. Um, looking at uh, proper exercise regimen, that it's not overdone, not too much is uh, bitten off that can't be chewed, uh, eye checkups, uh, assessment of, of drugs which impact on balance, on dizziness, uh, uh, there's a whole range of drugs which may uh, cause women to uh, be more prone to falls or, or, or instabilities. Uh, obviously recommend moderation in drinking, uh, safer clothes, more safer shoes, crepe soles, shoes that stick and don't, uh, don't slip, and arranging the household for maximum safety and not maximum risk, loose rugs, uh, um, objects that are in the way and not easily seen, slippery areas on uh, darkened areas and on uh, stairways. These are all important uh, areas. 
Now, we're committed to this. We're committed to treating osteoporosis. We, I wish we were a little better committed to some of the social and other uh, preventive measures. Um, but as we move forward, then it, it, we, we are under the gun to uh, try to identify more and more uh, which patients are good candidates or the best candidates for therapy. This takes us into a philosophical dispute in which many people have thought that it really the best way to approach the menopause is to advise estrogen for all or as many patients as possible. Uh, sort out the uh, the problems afterwards. And, you know, I have to say that uh, in many ways, uh, I'm not sure that this still isn't the best approach to it. Uh, obviously, there are many opponents of, of blanket estrogen use, and there are many, many studies that are now coming down the pike which uh, uh, gain, say, some of the, uh, the glowing reports about estrogen here and there. Uh, Alzheimer's, the heart, uh, and of course the, uh, the enduring uh, problem with uh, uh, the relationship of estrogen and breast cancer. Um, so we've taken to being a little bit more sophisticated in trying to identify which patients may be at highest risk and uh, to do that we resort mostly to uh, dual uh, energy x-ray absorptiometry, uh, the DEXA, so-called DEXA scans, uh, which give us uh, readings which take the bone mass of our patient and compare it to the bone mass of a healthy 25-year-old. Um, and then gives us a score which is read out usually as departures from the norm in a, in a uh, negative manner so that she's minus one standard deviation away that's considered still normal between minus one and minus 2.5 is considered osteopenic, they've, they've lost bone, uh, minus 2.5 or lower is osteoporosis and minus 2.5 or lower uh, um, plus fragility fractures uh, is severe or established osteoporosis. So these are the guidelines that we use. I suspect that they'll continue to change uh, going forward. We've uh, looked at some data ourselves in our own practice that maybe we should be interventional at a, at a higher um, uh, uh, T-score than has been traditional uh, from a cost-effectiveness basis. If you intervene in the process a little earlier, you sort of come out better at the end. Uh, the dual uh, energy x-ray absorption under the DEXA machine uh, is can you can measure either the total body or any one of peripheral sites uh, has many advantages uh, of high accuracy relatively safe relatively cheap as those things go uh, not cheap but uh, relatively affordable in the whole scheme of things so much so that even uh, the Medicare allows it um, there are some disadvantages that are influenced by changes, artifacts on the bones, fractures, osteoarthritis, spurs, anything that is there on the bone that's not, shouldn't be there uh, will affect it. Um, and uh, so that there are some drawbacks and you have to know uh, about that going in. This is the DEXA machine. It gives you a reading that looks somewhat like this. And if you look on the right-hand side to the colored graph, um, there's a lot of data that comes out on it. Uh, we're not really skilled or schooled in assembling all of that data. We're looking for the bottom line. So the bottom line can be in the form of that uh, white circle there on the on the graph that tells you where your patient is. And this particular patient is, is, is flirting with the disaster zone where she's at extremely high risk at the bottom, the red stripe across the bottom for uh, imminent fracture risk. Uh, you'll get a T-score, which will also tell you uh, where your patient is uh, uh, generally uh, uh, compared to younger standard norms. There's such a thing as a Z-score where she's compared to her age uh, equal compatriots, but that doesn't have uh, as much clinical uh, use uh, today. There are some shortfalls. We're, we're relying very heavily on DEXA in, in, in in motivating ourselves and our patients and uh, initiating therapy and following up on therapy and changing therapy. And, and if you use the DEXA, we have to understand that it's not a perfect uh, uh, measuring device. Uh, um, and uh, in the spine, for instance, we're limited, even though the biggest problem initially is in the thoracic spine with the kyphosis and dowager hump and uh, that we're limited to measurements of the lumbar spine because of the presence of sternum and ribs, which make it impossible to measure the upper uh, vertebra. And it's also important to understand that when fractures are already present, if you jump into the game relatively late, then your readings are relatively worthless. The hip is the, the uh, area of choice, but even in the hip, we've learned in uh, recent years that uh, what we've relied on in the past, particularly Ward's triangle, but also the femoral neck, these two areas, Ward's triangle or the femoral neck in general, may uh, be imprecise because of uh, the small areas, the small size. 
uh, osteoarthritic changes may impact uh, there also. The trochanter is an interesting site. It's mostly tri trabecular bone and appears to be very helpful as a, a place to look and to measure for uh, uh, um, bone mass loss. But I think the conventional wisdom is that we should go for the total hip, which is the femoral neck plus Ward's triangle plus the trochanter may be the preferred uh, measurement. It seems total hip with the data that we've assembled at this point uh, seems as to be a better predictor of uh, future, <coughs> excuse me, future fracture risk. Um, and it's also important to know that um, site-specific measurements may vary greatly. So there's not a, a great deal of absolute perfection built into all of this. We rely on bone mineral density, but, but remember, look, the slide I showed before is a curvilinear relationship. There's no specific fracture threshold. We, we tend to look at it in terms of, an, you know, it'd be no, below a certain area, as we saw in the bone densitometry readout there that uh, at the red line, she's at imminent fracture risk. But we've concluded that's about a 50% increased risk for fracture with every standard deviation of, uh, below the norm. But the different sites have different predictive values, and, and the predictive values are really better in older women. We tend to jump in, want to jump in in younger women, but uh, they have a much better predictability in the over the age of 60 or even over the age of 65. And it's also important to assess and evaluate and to put into the formula other risk factors for osteoporosis that may exist in a particular patient other than what the bone mineral density shows you. And it's also important to know that the DEXA are for Caucasian. The databases that we've established are for Caucasians. Uh, the, although they've, they've threatened us constantly to come up with a database for uh, African American patients and Asian patients and other ethnic uh, groups, uh, they're, to my knowledge, not universally uh, around right now. So that you have to always be careful when you uh, when you uh, read uh, into the uh, case of individual patients uh, what these results may be. It's, of course, a cliche to say that this is a white woman's disease to the same, literally the same degree, an Asian woman's di disease. That's not to say it isn't a black woman's disease. Vis-a-vis -vis white women, black women are generally better off as far as bone density are concerned, but vis-a-vis -vis black males, they're far worse off. And, the, and, the, uh, the, and as a matter of fact, we remember the very first patient of the old lady with the kyphosis and the cane, that's an African-American woman. Uh, that was pointed out to me uh, recently at another lecture that uh, it's not a well-known fact, but it's not to say that uh, being black uh, protects you against osteoporosis, uh, not the case at all. But it is important to know that the data that we've assembled, uh, that we use in these uh, DEXA scans are for Caucasian women. So we don't depend on exact correlation because we know that there are any number of studies. Here are two studies with alendronate, the fifth study and the EPIC study, which showed increase or preserved bone mineral density without uh, fracture reduction. Then there are other studies which show less effectiveness in, in, in increasing bone density, but with significant fracture reduction. So some agents uh, uh, have an ability to reduce fractures without affecting bone mineral density, and others uh, we've seen that there, there is a, an ability to increase bone mineral density without reducing fractures. These are gross generalizations, and of course we've seen the opposite to agents that do increase bone density and do decrease fractures. But as a clinician, you have to individualize case and be totally familiar with the results that you're reading. Bone mineral density in a number of studies has been shown to, to uh, motivate patients. So on that score alone, it may be interesting. I don't know if, if uh, in the end analysis it will be allowed on that basis because of the cost, but it certainly appears uh, serial bone mineral densities appear to enhance compliance adherence to, uh, to, uh, to uh, therapy. But it's also important, don't overdo it. Bone loss is 1% to 2% per year on average. The sensitivity is uh, 2 to 3% in the spine. Uh, the smallest detectable difference in the hip is around 4 or 5%. Don't do these studies more than once every two years. You certainly are not going to pick up uh, discernible uh, differences in, in the majority of patients. So general guidelines to test all postmenopausal Caucasian women over the age of 65 or under the age of 65 if they have risk factors taken off that old academic list. Um, and uh, to use the proximal femur, the total hip if possible. Um, and, uh, but in the younger patients, the best area to look is in the, in the spine, as I've said, because the most rapid early onset uh, bone loss is there. Um, 
And uh, you can use peripheral areas for screening in older women. If you can't do the hip because of a fracture or the spine because of a fracture, you can screen with peripheral. There is some correlation with what would have been in the hip. Could you have been able to uh, measure the hip? It may be very, from study to study, 60 to 80 percent. As a screening technique, these peripheral measurements of a finger or the elbow or the heel are much cheaper, much quicker, more convenient for patients, can be done in the office, should not be ignored, even though purists may take uh, issue with uh, the results. But I think the general consensus is that there's somewhat good correlation with them and it can be used as, as a, at the minimum, as a uh, screening uh, test. We use bone density to predict fracture risk, obviously, but also to diagnose the, the presence of uh, osteoporosis, uh, to evaluate our therapies, to identify patients, to motivate uh, patients, and to monitor the therapies. And the government bone measurement, uh, mass measurement act of 1998, uh, re-fortifies that. It allows even in Medicare patients for uh, biannual uh, bone mineral density measurements uh, in specifically in the estrogen deficient uh, women at clinical risk for osteoporosis, virtually every woman that passes your gay, um, every Caucasian woman, an individual with vertebral abnormalities shown on x-ray that are in indicative of osteoporosis can then be followed up with serial uh, uh, bone uh, mineral density measurements. Long-term glucocorticoid users, very important group of patients that gynecologists tend to uh, overlook. Um, hyperparathyroidism, and as the monitoring of FDA-approved therapeutic uh, agents. So all of these things support you if you want to do bone mineral densities. Don't be daunted by results. This is a, a concept on Cummings looking at bone mineral densities. Uh, invented this uh, neat little phrase, the regression to the mean, that people just towards, tend to flee towards an average. So that women are of a high bone density the first year you measure, tend to, you know, they, they slough off the second year. Women who have a low bone density tend to uh, increase. They all get to about the same average. Uh, uh, after a few years of uh, therapy. So therefore what Cummins is admonishing us is not to discontinue patients just because you don't have an immediate result, uh, uh, positive result in your bone mineral density. Other people have looked at immediate positive results by looking at the bone markers. The bone markers have not gained a, a significant foothold in, uh, in uh, osteoporosis in this country for a variety of reasons, mainly the, the uh, bone uh, resorption markers, the urinary markers, call for 24-hour urine collections and, you know, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, these are relatively expensive tests, but they're there. Um, the uh, collagen cross-link uh, 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 products, uh, pyridinolin and deoxypyridinolin and the N and C uh, telepeptides. Then bone formation, which are serum markers, used even less, uh, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase and uh, osteocalcin. They are predictably elevated in menopausal women. And the uh, green bar, early menopause, and the red bars, late menopause, um, serum osteocalcin on the left, and next, uh, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, these are formation markers, and the C and N telepeptides on the right. They predictably go up in menopausal women. So they make a good target if you're looking to measure what you're doing uh, to something. And, and, um, and people who are advocates of using markers are advocates of using markers to, to assess therapy uh, very quickly. No one has ever been able to correlate markers with fracture risk, and I think it's a wasted effort if you want to uh, follow patients uh, along those lines. But if you want to monitor the therapy and uh, you have some anxiety about it, then uh, you can resort to using the uh, bone or serum uh, markers. Now, as far as treating osteoporosis, to get to the final part of our lecture today, uh, we have a great deal available to us. The linchpin, obviously, is estrogen because estrogen is the holistic drug. It may not be the best drug for osteoporosis, but it's a good drug for osteoporosis. But in a holistic sense, in treating the entire menopausal woman with the, across a broad spectrum of menopausal uh, uh, problems, there is no uh, argument against the use of estrogen uh, as a primary agent. Uh, you can use uh, other agents in women who have severe osteoporosis going in and can be used uh, um, intercurrently with uh, estrogen. 
Um, there are many modes of application. Oral is preferred, parenteral with some adherence, both injection, uh, uh, injections, transdermal, and now the European uh, creams that are rubbed on, the transdermal patches, now the creams. Vaginal, uh, mainly for local effect, is uh, for the most part a uh, little systemic effect, rings and creams. Various protocols, cyclic, early month period, mid-month periods, late month periods, or continuous combined, hoping for no periods whatsoever, or continuous combined weekdays on, weekends. So if there are a number of different protocols, and uh, it just is uh, um, the uh, uh, business of the clinician to choose which, which uh, hormone and which uh, uh, method of application. If you're looking at conjugated equine estrogen as a benchmark, 6.25 has been identified. 0.625, I'm sorry, 0.625 has been identified as the uh, the dose that preserves bone. Although recent literature has shown that 0.3 um, may preserve bone in more positive calcium balance patients, and lower doses may be preferable in very early perimenopause or very very late menopause, where safety uh, factors are a consideration for uh, your thought. Progestins, um, there's some thought uh, to the um, testosterone derived, the, uh, the androgen derived progestins. The C19s is potentially at least looking, theoretically should have better potential than the C21s. We've not had head to head studies to show that or not. Um, and uh, the androgens are playing a growing role, although it's a, sort of a niche, but for years androgens were sort of taboo because of side effects. Now the very low dose androgens have shown to enhance estrogenic effect on, on bone health, uh, as well as being less uh, um, dangerous for lipids and other the common traditional side effects that we've attributed to androgen use. And now the non-hormonal, the bisphosphonates, of which we're into the second and third generations, now into the third generations with residronate um, and combined uh, additive hormone and bisphosphonate therapy. The serums are making a lot of noise. Uh, I have some enthusiasm about the serums. I think that they may, if they continue to manipulate the molecules and, and, and attack more and more menopausal symptoms, there may be a role for the serums. They certainly appear to decrease the risk of breast cancer, whereas estrogen has been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer in many studies. Calcitonin has not won a whole lot of uh, purchase in this part of the country. Uh, has been used for focal bone pain in the spine. Um, doesn't enhance bone mineral density particularly well. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say just out of lack of personal experience with the natural of phytoestrogens except to say that uh, the scientific base for a conclusion in one direction or another with them is uh, probably for the most part lacking. Calcium, you know, people who are anti-estrogen or anti-establishment and think that everything can be treated over the counter put, have been pushing calcium and vitamin D for years. Uh, it's been sort of a controversy. Many papers say that they, they're, they're healthy for you, should take them, but they don't really affect bone. This uh, study by Dawson Hughes in the New England Journal a few years ago, they gave calcium and vitamin D. Uh, to menopausal women over the age of 65, so good candidates for bad bones. Um, and uh, they found that there were positive significant changes in total uh, body uh, bone mineral density as well as femoral neck and spine after one year. After two or three years, it was only significant in the, as a total body. Um, but if you looked at fracture reductions in, in a very small study, actually too small a cohort to really warrant too much, uh, consideration, uh, there was significant reduction in uh, non-vertebral fractures in women taking calcium and vitamin D vis be women on uh, placebo controls. Um, I don't think anyone is advocating, seriously advocating calcium and vitamin D as the primary approach to osteoporosis, it's uh, prevention or treatment. Treatments belong to the, the uh, proven agents uh, and all of these agents which are listed uh, there for the most part on the left, uh, work as anti-resorptive agents, so they inhibit uh, resorption of bone and pretty much all intervene in the same way. Estrogen has been shown to be associated loss of estrogen with a decrease of bone, so the uh, replacement of estrogen with an increase of bone, um, it does uh, maintain or increase uh, bone mineral density, and as I've said before, it is a more holistic drug than almost anything else out there. The serums have some other very positive properties, but uh, certainly not against hot flushes and other uh, things, other areas where estrogen acts positively. Um, estrogen has troublesome side effects, as it says here, including bleeding, fluid retention, headaches. Um, we don't have good fracture risk, and, and estrogen has recently lost an indication 
lost its indication for the treatment of osteoporotic fracture. It's only for the prevention of osteoporotic fracture. I have no doubt that when proper studies are done, estrogen may regain uh, its indication, um, but uh, those studies may not be done since there are so much, uh, so many potent uh, anti-resorptors there that can enhance estrogen and be used together with it. Um, we, and we deal with the 30% increased risk of breast cancer with long-term estrogen use and the 300% increased risk of, uh, of uh, venous thromboembolism with estrogen, albeit that's a, that's a dramatic number, but the, but the actual problem is uh, not that great. Endometrial uh, hyperplasia in cancer uh, is uh, avoided with the addition of uh, progestins. Estrogen is effective. Uh, you can see in the gray bar there, uh, heading uh, 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 down to the right that uh, women taking nothing lose bone predictably and if you jump in with estrogen promptly at the onset of menopause you can maintain bone at its outset level. If you jump in a few years later you maintain bone at a lower level. A few years lower later still you continue to maintain bone but always at a lower level. This and the fact that when you discontinue estrogen bone begins to rapidly uh, lose its mass again have been known for a long long time. This is a study by Lindsay that was published some 13 years ago. There's a more recent study in 1997, the British Journal of OBGYN, uh, showing uh, estrogen's effect on bone mineral density in the spine, uh, lumbar spine, uh, showing uh, impressive uh, um, increases in bone mineral density uh, in uh, a five-year study in postmenopausal women vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, placebo controls with a high significance. Um, and yet, um, there are some caveats about estrogen, and I think as clinicians we need to know it. This is a paper published in the Annals of Internal Medicine five years ago by Colley, um, and it showed that um, you need to keep taking estrogen, and you need to take it for a long time. We used to think that even a short-term use of estrogen affects a 50% reduction in fractures. It may re affect a 50% reduction in fractures, but we probably need to take it for longer periods of time than we thought, and that cuts into the breast cancer argument. So it puts us at odds uh, with ourselves in trying to trying to uh, uh, evolve or construct a a, 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 a um, uh, thorough and rational uh, approach to uh, the menopause in general and osteoporosis in, the, in specific. So the current users with less than 10 years of uh, estrogen use had non-significant relative uh, risk uh, uh, loss of fracture vis-a-vis um, -vis women who taken estrogen more than 10 years and part previous use was not associated with a, de a decrease of uh, fracture. So that their conclusion, where the data suggests that in this particular paper that estrogen's protection against hip fracture requires long-term use and uh, undergoes uh, degradation as soon as you continue, uh, discontinue estrogen therapy. The Hearst study has weighed in, unfortunately, you now with, with uh, arrows and slings and bobs flying all over the horizon with data that in the Hearst study, uh, estrogen did not reduce fracture risk. But this is a study obviously aimed at heart patients and bone status was never uh, properly established in this, not to my knowledge anyway, and I was a principal investigator here in the Hearst study at Baylor. Um, the osteoporosis research group sticks by their meta-analytical uh, uh, investigations which confirm a 50% reduction in fracture incidence in estrogen users with, you know, providing that they uh, use estrogen promptly and effectively and for a long enough uh, amount of time. Progestins have had an interesting run. Uh, the progesterone receptor was identified in bone a number of years ago. Uh, Christiansen and his people in Denmark and others have proposed a, a role for progestins in, in bone uh, in, in treatment of uh, osteoporosis. Um, it's not come down to that in this country. There's a rare uh, case in which you would give progestin to a woman who's not getting estrogen. So it would be difficult to assess and gauge that. One of the values of the PEPI study showed that for the first time, uh, you can see on the right, uh, the addition of uh, pure progesterone uh, uh, to uh, um, micronized progesterone to conjugated equine estrogens uh, was just as good as medroxyprogesterone acetate. For many years, uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate has had an almost uh, uh, unimpeded run at uh, uh, menopausal therapy. It's had a, a few, uh, few competitors, and uh, now there have been some uh, data coming out which indicate that there may be other progestins that we need to look at. This, uh, the PEPI trial, uh, which was published in JAMA four years ago, showed that uh, micronized pure progesterone probably just as effective uh, together with estrogen in preventing uh, bone loss. 
And now I alluded to the difference between the C21 uh, progestins uh, and the uh, C19 progestins, the androgenic derived. We don't have the data to sustain one versus the other. In theory, the uh, testosterone uh, derived uh, progestin should be uh, a little bit better in protecting bone. And, and then t testosterone itself, as I briefly mentioned before, uh, has been shown to enhance the role, the effects of estrogen on bone mineral density, even low dose methyl testosterone. And it's available in doses as low as 1.25 or 2.5 milligrams per day. Uh, they've proven pretty effective in um, uh, um, enhancing uh, bone growth. Um, they have uh, less uh, less to fear as far as uh, untoward effects on the lipid profile. Uh, as, uh, androgens have arguably some uh, a role to play uh, in libido and other uh, um, neurological uh, uh, functions in the uh, early menopause. So I think we'll be probably looking at uh, more ongoing studies in this country with the role of androgens and particularly uh, uh, in uh, bone. The SERMs, again, uh, are their sole indication for raloxifen is for the treatment and the indications for the treatment and uh, prevention of osteoporosis. And they do an effective job. They're not as good as the bisphosphonates uh, in uh, promoting bone mineral density, but they have uh, a good fracture reduction in the vertebra. There's no hip data um, really worth mentioning. But in both the hip and the spine, they do enhance uh, um, uh, bone mineral density, these are in postmenopausal women without osteoporosis. Um, here are some data in fracture reduction uh, with raloxifen in women with osteoporosis. <coughs> and if you'll see in the right series of bars that uh, there is an impressive reduction of fractures in women with pre-existing fracture and that led uh, in the past year to raloxifen getting an indication for the treatment as well as the prevention of uh, osteoporosis. Raloxifen is neutral on the endometrium, uh, which uh, um, uh, has, um, makes uh, some concessions to uh, um, contemplating its use. It appears to be as uh, potent as tamoxifen in reducing breast cancer, which uh, also is a very positive. On the other hand, it has been associated with hot flushes. It does not address the early menopausal uh, problems of vasomotor, vaginal dryness, et cetera. Uh, there will be a role for the serums going forward, I, I believe. Um, but it needs to be clarified a little bit. I've been enthusiastic about the SERMs. I don't want to uh, indicate that I'm not. I think in certain areas they uh, uh, can play a role, um, in, even in a more holistic sense. Calcitonin, again, has been used for focal pain. For uh, um, It's an easy drug to uh, use. There have been some uh, problems with nasal uh, irritation. It does not change bone mineral density as uh, well as some of the others. And the bisphosphonates appear as a family of drugs to be the most potent uh, bone enhancers. And so much so that you see them pushed uh, rather dramatically by internists, rheumatologists, other people dealing with osteoporosis. Gynecologists have been reluctant to look at bisphosphonates in the first line because we've had to deal more uh, with the total menopausal patient. And clearly, the bisphosphonates role is limited to the bone, at least as we know it today. Uh, we've gone through three generations into our third generation of bisphosphonates with, with rather dramatic and impressive increase in anti-resorptive biological activity in the third generation uh, drugs, which make them uh, um, very appealing to me uh, clinically. Um, you have the uh, phosphorcarbon uh, uh, group there in the center, which is the uh, center of biological activity, and then the side chains, which determine certain other uh, um, activities. Um, um, potency and anti-resorptive uh, strengths. These are, in uh, the etidronate represented the first. It uh, was involved in the so-called coherence therapy years ago, uh, then was a standalone drug. Um, alendronate was a second generation, still has a, uh, a important uh, a role in the marketplace today and in the treatment of osteoporosis, but the third generations of which residronate is the uh, one uh, on the market now uh, have really enhanced um, uh, anti-resorptive potency. 
uh, as well as less side effects. And uh, that makes them extremely appealing to clinicians, uh, uh, particularly in dealing with women with uh, um, advanced uh, osteoporosis. These are some alendronate data. This is in early menopausal women, so without a great deal of uh, bone loss, enhancement of uh, impressive enhancement of uh, bone mineral density in the lumbar spine. Uh, again, alendronate um, in women uh, presumably older with existing vertebral fractures with impressive in increases of bone mineral density in the hip and, uh, and in the spine also. And uh, consequently, uh, uh, without too much imagination, um, a reduction in fractures at the uh, um, vertebral, uh, possibly at the hip. The FIT uh, study with the lantern I did show in uh, one, one of the studies uh, some hip fracture reduction uh, in another. That was uh, not the case reduction of Kali's fractures also. This is resedronate, the uh, third generation drug with the enhanced potency and um, l probably less side effects also, uh, uh, maybe by as much as two thirds less side effects, um, these being mainly gastroesophageal irritation, which have uh, made the uh, protocol for delivering uh, the bisphosphonates uh, uh, somewhat complicated from a few patients. Uh, this shows early menopausal, postmenopausal women uh, resendronates and bone, bone mineral density would resendronate uh, on um, the lumbar spine, the femoral neck, the hip trochanter, very, very impressive data here. Um, these are in uh, women with low bone mass. Those are women, the first group of women with uh, normal bone mass. And here, extremely imp impressive reversal of of uh, bone loss at uh, all three areas here, the femoral neck, the hip trochanter, and the, the lumbar spine. And consequently, again, a no-brainer, uh, you would, uh, as you would imagine, a reduction in fractures, say 40 to 50 percent in vertebral fractures, and a 30 to 40 percent in uh, reduction in non-vertebral fractures. Um, which is uh, extremely impressive. Again, it makes this drug very appealing. Uh, the uh, bisphosphonates in general uh, are uh, considered uh, frontline drugs now by more and more people, and adjuvant drugs can be used interchangeably with, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, used intercurrently with uh, estrogen or SIRMs uh, for that matter. And here is some uh, data from Mike McClung in Oregon, recently uh, looking at um, women with. Uh, um, low femoral neck bone mineral density with a 39% reduction in hip fracture. Um, this was in Osteoporosis International this year. Uh, and women with a low femoral neck bone mineral density plus prevalent uh, non-hip fractures, a 58% reduction in hip fracture. This is extremely, uh, extremely impressive um, data. In a group of women who were just being uh, enrolled on clinical risk factors, there was no obvious reduction in hip fracture, but these were women in whom their osteoporotic status was not uh, significantly established. Um, also impressive, and, and residronate has gone out of its way to uh, um, uh, get into the, the specific area of glucocortico uh, steroid induced osteoporosis and have some very impressive data here uh, published by Cohen in 1998 looking at um, residronate at the five milligram level which is mainly what we use in osteoporosis. Uh, it can be used as much as 30 milligrams in Pagets uh, but looking at reversal of bone loss at the lumbar spine in uh, femoral neck and the trochanter, uh, very impressive. Uh, in corticosteroid users, we know that these are particular people at high risk for uh, bone loss. And uh, again, the attendant reduction in uh, vertebral fracture risk. These are patients on, gluco, uh, on corticosteroids uh, taking residronate, and you can see a very impressive reduction in fractures in this particular subset of patients. We can add these together. And uh, you'll see effects on fracture, you'll see effects on bone mineral density, and you will see effects, immediate effects, in, uh, in the area of the bone markers should you uh, be disposed to use uh, bone markers. We need more data. We're showing trends. We don't have a whole lot of science here uh, to disseminate. Uh, but it appears, because this is frequently asked and frequently requested uh, from clinicians, can we put some of these things together? Knowing that these bisphosphonates are extremely potent in the area of uh, of uh, bone, uh, of treating osteoporosis, reversing it. Uh, can you add them together to estrogens and serums? And uh, from what we have in preliminary data, it clearly appears that there are some additive effects, and so that you may um, 
uh, be able to do that. And finally, to conclude, just to summarize a little bit about the therapy, I think I've tried to make some points here that osteoporosis is a severe epidemiological, financial, social problem here and an individual medical problem. It has severe consequences. Um, it is a battle that we begin to fight probably a little late in life if, if we could begin to, uh, to uh, redress some of the problems that lead to osteoporosis at, at an earlier age in the majority of our patients, then we'd be far better off. Nevertheless, failing to do that as we join battle with osteoporosis at age 50 or into the early menopause, we have made impressive strides. We have impressive uh, agents at hand. We have made impressive um, advances, recent advances. Um, HRT, hormone replacement and estrogen replacement therapy will remain probably the linchpin of general menopausal therapy. I think the door is swung open now to uh, the use of bisphosphonates together with hormones should um, uh, the, a desired uh, uh, outcome uh, in osteoporosis not be achieved with hormone therapy alone. Calcitonin still has a relatively diminished role and the CIRMs um, while the future may look bright for them, I think a lot of uh, water will flow under the bridge before that, that uh, um, problem is resolved entirely. I think the CIRMs have impressive uh, ability to decrease breast cancer. That will always be a strong selling point in this country since breast cancer is the emotional disease in the menopause and motives and motivates a lot of what we do as doctors and what our patients accept and do uh, on the other side of the desk so that this particular uh, characteristic of the serums in reducing the risk of breast cancer may enhance their um, appeal. But as far as bones are concerned, I think uh, the present gold standard is with the bisphosphonates. Um, and uh, it appears that the third generation bisphosphonates as represented by resedronate appears to be one with the enhanced potency and um, with less side effects. So that uh, makes it a drug that you would want to uh, look at and uh, add to your uh, uh, armamentarium in treating uh, osteoporosis. So I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you.